So welcome to uh, Your Mind at Work, uh, the first session called Under the Hood. And uh, I do have to say that I, uh, I do want to pay a, a special uh, compliment to Jane because Jane has the most difficult job imaginable um, because she does the second half of Your Mind at Work the following Wednesday after I do my sessions on the, the third Thursday of the month. And, and, and why I want to compliment Jane and, and, and ask you all to empathize with her is because she has to take all of this theoretical stuff that I'm about to share with you over the next nine months and then convert it into something meaningful that can be applied in the workplace. So we are definitely a dynamic duo, but Jane gets the hard bit because I, I get the easy bit because I just tell you how the brain's working. And then Jane has to go away and say, you see, now you understand that it works like that. This is what you have to do in the workplace when this happens. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a plug for Jane, but it's also a little bit of empathy because she gets the difficult bit. I get the easy bit. Now, as we go through um, this, this series, uh, my half of uh, your mind at work, I am going to be honest with you and admit that I am serializing a book on the brain. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on brains. I do have a diploma in modern applied psychology amongst other things. But I, I am relying on a particular book to help me. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what the book is actually today. I'm going to tell you the name of the book in the last session on the 22nd of June. Why am I doing that? You might ask yourself. Well, it's because I've attended too many sessions of the Tech Connects Marketing Peer Group. This is called a tease. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So as we go through today, um, think about what your definition of mindfulness is before we actually go through any of the material today. And uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a for example. I asked my youngest son, uh, you know, what do you think the definition of mindfulness is? He says, well, I know what the answer to that is. It's when your head's full of stuff. As in mind full. That's not quite the definition that I had in mind, but it was interesting that he thought that was what we were going to talk about today because I was telling him about the peer group. So think about your definition, but in the context of knowing yourself is the first step to any change. If you, if you can understand what goes on in your mind, you might have a better way of understanding what potentially is going on in the minds of others, which is what the whole Your Mind at Work program is actually all about. So today we're going to look at some definitions. We're going to look at workplace effectiveness through mindfulness. We're going to be talking about something called the MOS, the Mindful Awareness Attention Scale. We're also going to talk about maps, networks and circuits, which actually I'll let you into a little secret are all the same thing. But um, these neuroscientists have actually invented three different expressions, which all mean the same thing, maps, networks and circuits. Then we'll do a quick exercise. Then we'll talk about why you have to practice mindfulness. And then there's some exercises that I can make available to people who are interested. And hopefully we can have a discussion around uh, this topic. But what I will tell you today is, um, you know, we're not gonna sit in a lotus position and all go, um, we're not gonna climb a mountain or do yoga or meditate or anything like that. They are ways in which you can achieve mindfulness. But mindfulness itself is a state of mind. And so, you know, I, I draw that distinction before we get started and hopefully it'll become clear. Uh, so here's one or two definitions. First, I want to start off with a quote. Uh, the unexamined life, observing yourself, is not worth living. So says Socrates. I do want to clear something up actually at this stage. Uh, in my lifetime, I've known two people called Socrates. One was actually a fantastic Brazilian footballer who scored uh, some amazing goals in the 1982 World Cup in Spain. The other one was actually a Greek philosopher. And just to be completely transparent, it's the one on the right who said, the unexamined life observing yourself is not worth living. Think about that for a second. If you think about yourself, you're living a life worth living. If you don't think about yourself, you're not living a life worth living. So. Basically, the punchline is, if we reflect on ourselves, the quality of our lives will be better. And that's something that you can definitely link 
to mindfulness. So here are a few definitions, because as I was doing the research for this and reading chapter one of the book that I'm not going to tell you the title to, um, it became clear that there are several different expressions being bandied about. And I got terribly confused at one point. And I thought if I don't write these down and actually look at them one by one, I, th I think I might confuse myself and potentially anybody who comes to the peer group. So if you hear somebody say metacognition, it means they are actually thinking about their thinking. What am I thinking about? Why am I thinking about? How am I thinking about? And that's really part of the, ex uh, of the uh, quote from Socrates. Meta-awareness is when you're aware of your awareness, that you're aware that you're thinking about your thinking. So you might need meta-awareness to actually display metacognition. Maybe. If you ask yourself the question, am I aware, you have achieved awareness. If you ask yourself the question, am I aware, you are aware, because if you've asked that question, you have to be. There's no choice. But that's what meta-awareness means. Self-awareness, which Jane's going to be talking about next Wednesday, is the capacity to step outside of your own skin. Step outside of your own skin and observe yourself with as close an objective eye as possible. So you sort of move away from Pete and you look back at Pete and what's Pete doing? Why is he doing that? What's causing him to behave in that way, to say the things that he does, to do the things that he does? That's what self-awareness is. And then we have mindfulness. The whole point about mindfulness, it's an experience. It's the experience of paying close attention to the present, the here and now, the, this present moment in an open and accepting way. What does that mean? It means that you are recognizing thoughts, emotions, feelings that are going through the mind, the body, but you're not judging yourself. You're just saying, I feel angry at the moment. I feel stressed at the moment. I feel happy at the moment and letting them go. It's a bit like a, a leaf on a river, if you think about it. Thoughts come and go. Just watch them come, watch them go. That's what mindfulness is. But it's really about things that are happening to you in real time and being able to accept them. And this is where it gets tricky. Because if you think about it, one second ago is the past and the future hasn't arrived yet. But it, the present moment is almost like a split second. So being aware of what you're doing second to second to second to second takes an awful lot of concentration. So here are some of the things, and I'm going to put this uh, particular slide up several times just to remind us it's all about experience, the here and now, real time, accepting what you see, not judging yourself, not judging others. Those of you who attended the uh, design thinking uh, peer group last year will know that the definition of empathy, the first stage of design thinking is listening to understand, not to judge. You've, also, you've almost got to see it in the light of listening to yourself. Little stories, little voices are in your head. You can't get away from that. They are there and they will appear on a regular basis. And you have to accept that they're going to appear on a regular basis. Everybody's the same. When we practice mindfulness, we do create the ability to pause before we react. And that ultimately is the difference between reacting and responding. You react in the spur of the moment. You respond when you've taken that deep breath, that step back, even if it's only for one or two seconds, and then you respond in a way that's considered. So we say that it's the space of mind in which we consider various options, get mad, don't get mad, ask more questions, and then choose the most appropriate ones. And it's an integral part, therefore, of emotional intelligence. So when we pause, we pay attention, we acknowledge if we've made any assumptions, we understand the perspective, we seek different perspectives, and then we examine our options and make a decision. And you can't do that if you react. Now, when you see it on the screen like that, 
<laughs> and you see it sort of listed from P-A-U-S-E. You think, oh, this is great, this is easy. No, it isn't. It is the way you do it, but it requires focus and attention, and they are the key components of mindfulness. And the rest of this course, everything I'm going to tell you from November to June cannot work without mindfulness. If you have no mindfulness, you cannot be in control of emotions, thoughts, behavior, how you react, how you self-manage, how you're self-aware, how you manage others. It is a fact. Workplace effectiveness. Here are a couple of examples where being mindful uh, is, is key to what you've seen on the screen. So a couple of examples. Listening to a hunch that you're emailing away, but somehow maybe I should stop doing this and think about planning my day better. Because right now I'm just emailing, emailing, email, and I'm going around in circles. If you listen to that hunch, then you're being mindful. If you notice that you need to focus so that you don't get lost driving to a meeting, for example, you are also being mindful. Why do I say that? Listening to a hunch and noticing that you need to focus. Why, why is that being mindful? Somebody have a guess. No. It's being mindful because you're listening. You're listening to yourself. You're listening to the voices in your head, the signals that your brain is sending you. And why this is so important to workplace effectiveness. Every single session from November to June is going to talk about brain energy, how we make decisions, how we multitask or try to, the distractions that get in the way and how we can fight back against distractions, impasse against insight, so when the brain gets stuck and what you can do about it, the dramas that unfold in the workplace and how to react to those, or how to handle uncertainty, how to manage expectations and how to collaborate and dealing with inclination natural urges if you like all of those things happen in the workplace and they happen to an extent whether you're being mindful or you're not being mindful if you're on autopilot you're not being mindful but there are times when autopilot or the subconscious is exactly what you want to be and we have some examples of that as we go through the uh, program so again being aware of experience as it occurs in real time and accepting what you see. So how do you measure mindfulness? Kirk Brown at the Virginia Commonwealth University came up with this thing called the MOS, the Mindful Awareness Attention Scale. What this reflects is that some people are better at listening to themselves, if you like, noticing those internal signals from the body and the brain better than others. This is called interoception. Now, if you are a Star Trek fan, and I admit it publicly, I am, a few years ago now with the old original cast of Star Trek, um, there was a film called The Voyage Home. I think they call it Star Trek IV. In that movie, right at the start, good old Spock, if you recognize him, had died, but miraculously been brought back to life. And before you say anything, come on, this is science fiction. OK, he was dead and then he was alive and et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, his brain was mush. So when they got Spock back to Vulcan, they had to retrain his mind. So he went into this room with all the computers that the Vulcans had available to them. And he started memory tests and he, he started to learn mathematics again and he started to learn science again. And, the, and then the computer was rapid fire asking him all these questions to test that his brain was getting back to the level that it was prior to his demise. And these rapid fire questions continued and continued and continued for several minutes until the computer suddenly asked. How do you feel? How do you feel? And at that point in the movie, if anybody's familiar with this, poor old Spock was absolutely stumped. 
Why was he stumped? Because he's half Vulcan. Vulcans have no emotions, you see. That's the whole thing of the original Star Trek uh, character of Spock. He did not know how to, uh, how to react to how do you feel, which meant that on the mass scale, he was a zero. He had no interoception. Interoception is the sense that allows us to answer the question, how do I feel? Just what Spock couldn't do at any given moment. And how do I feel includes thoughts, emotions, decision-making, and the sense of self. Now, if you've got an ego, and some people have suggested that I do, my wife included, you are going to love mindfulness because it's all about you. That's what mindfulness is, the sense of self. How am I doing? How am I feeling? It's all about you. Therefore, if you do have any kind of ego, you're going to love this mindfulness stuff. So this thing that Kirk invented is now the gold standard for measuring an individual's everyday mindfulness. And it is, ver uh, we're not, we haven't got time to go through the actual test today, but it is something that is used as the benchmark in terms of people's scores for mindfulness. The point is, just like poor old Spock, everyone has the capacity to be mindful, but levels of mindfulness will vary. Now, they'll vary from individual to individual but they'll also vary in an individual. You can be mindful at one moment and then mind less in the next moment. And it's something that's very hard to control. So the thing that Kirk really proved in his research at the university there in the States was that people's mass scores are positively correlated with their physical and mental health and the quality of their relationships at work and outside of work. Think about that for a second. My ability to be mindful is going to depend on how physically healthy I am, how mentally healthy I am, and the quality of the relationships that I hold with the people most dear inside of work and outside of work. And this is empirically proven. The number one thing to take away from that might be if you have some tricky relationships at work, now's the time to start thinking about how you might improve them because it will help your mindfulness score. And now I want to talk about Norman Farb, a local boy from the University of Toronto. And Norm has done some amazing work on the brain and the things that make you mindful or make you less mindful. And this is the section on maps, networks, and circuits. So we all create internal representations of the outside world, and they're the two key words there, outside world, representations of the outside world in our brains called maps, or you can call them networks, or we can call them circuits, but Norm called them maps. This is really a key point. If, for example, you are an accountant, you will have many, many maps related to numbers, related to finance, related to debits, to credits, to trial balances, to income statements, to balance sheets, to cash flow statements. If you are a lawyer, you will have many, many maps related to legal rules and regulations things that you have to know to do your job. And these maps all develop over time. You are developing maps right now as we speak based on what you're paying your attention to at any given time. But if you're in a particular functional area like HR, like legal, like finance, uh, anything that, whereas as, you know, a, a technical guy in an IT company, a developer, your maps that have developed, the way your brain functions is based on what you've paid attention to. Hence, although every single human being has a brain that functions in the same way, that's why we're all so different to a large extent, because all of those experiences from childhood to right now, this very minute, have been mapped over time and have influenced the way you think and your ability to be mindful. Some maps will emerge automatically. So your senses smell, taste, etc., etc. they develop automatically and they're not controlled by the upstairs brain, as I call it, which is the neocortex. 
it's controlled in another area of the brain altogether, and we don't need to worry about that right now just yet. So good old Norm discovered that there are two distinct ways of interacting with the world using two different sets of maps, and everybody has these. Set of maps one, set of maps two. The first set of maps is called the default network or the narrative network. The second set of maps is called the direct experience and both interchange to decide by how much you can be mindful as, a, as an individual. So let's look at the default network first. It's called default because it becomes active when not too much else is happening and you start to think about yourself. How about that for an ego? As soon as your body and your brain starts to think, oh, I've got nothing to do, I'll think about me. Well, why not? That's an interesting topic and you can't stop yourself from doing it. You will default to that because if there's nothing else going on, the brain can't stand a vacuum. You have to do something unless you're asleep, of course. But even when you're asleep, you're doing something. That's another topic for another day. But it is the default network. So if you don't think there's too much going on, I'll think about me. That way I can keep the brain active. That would be good. So think about the default network as the map or the network involved in planning, daydreaming and ruminating. And that's where it gets the second name narrative. Because all the time you're telling yourself little stories. That's what the default network does. And most of those stories are about you and how you interact with all the people that you know and all the things that you do and all the places that you've been, including on TV, by the way. And all those things are coming together in a great big melting pot in the brain. And you're trying to process this information all the time. So the narrative is the storyline with all these characters that you've got in your head interacting with one another over time. So when the default network is active, you're thinking about your past and your future, but you're not thinking about your present. It's about all the people you know and how all of this giant tapestry of information weaves together. The big thing about the default network is that it processes information from the outside world and just interprets it. And as it interprets it, guess what? We start to make assumptions and we start to make judgments. And if we're mindful, we don't. But if you're not being mindful, that's exactly what's going to happen with the default network. The default network is the external map. Everything that's coming at you that you're trying to process, that your poor brain, your overused, overactive brain is trying to process and make sense of. That's the default network or the narrative circuitry. Then we've got the direct experience. When the direct experience map or network is active, different regions of the brain are now kicking in. And it's not the default network. You're no longer starting to tell yourself stories. When it's activated, you're not considering much at all. Your thoughts, your thinking process starts to shut down you are experiencing other sensations. So the brain is still active, it's not a vacuum, but you're no longer thinking and planning and ruminating or storytelling. There's not a lot of that going on because now we're into direct experience. So to try and illustrate, if you feel the warmth of the sun on your head or your body or your arms, or you feel a cool breeze in your hair, or more to the point, that cold beer in your hand, and you're experiencing the cold beer in your hand, that is a different map to the default network. It's all about what you're sensing and experiencing. The narrative network and the direct experience network are inversely correlated. So as one kicks in, the other stops. As the other kicks in, the other stops. The two don't work together. It's one or the other. So, if your narrative circuitry is going crazy, worrying about an upcoming stressful event, and we're all guilty of it, it helps to take a deep breath. And this is the nearest I'm going to get to breathing, meditating and yoga. It helps to take a deep breath. Take a step back. Focus on the present moment. Slow things down. Because 
at that moment of focusing on your breath. The in-breath, the out-breath. You cannot focus on the stress. If you truly focus on the in-breath and the out-breath, your brain cannot work with the other. The stress is gone. If you think about this, this is the way some people get over pain. Yeah, you're going to somebody's face. I've got a terrible toothache and I can't get into the dentist until next Monday. And people say, oh, that's terrible. You know, I feel really bad for you. Can you take any Advil? Well, I don't know. You know, there's a bit of a shortage at the moment. But actually, the power is within you. If you can be mindful, you can dilute the pain. Because as you think about something else, yourself, and not the pain of the toothache, the pain goes away. I'm going to try that sometime. It actually works. So... The direct experience map or networks or circuits is all about internal processing, not what the external world is doing. And that's the big difference between the two. So let's test this with a little exercise for you. And so there's going to be in the next minute an embarrassing radio silence. To the joy of some people, at least, I'm actually going to shut up. But while I shut up, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. For the next minute, I want you to focus on the feeling of sitting in your chair, or if you're standing, the feeling of standing up. But that's really important. Pay close attention to the springiness, the texture, the comfort level of sitting in your chair. You have to focus all of your attention for the next minute on sitting in that chair. And I don't want you to think of anything else. So for the next minute, please focus on the feeling of sitting in your chair. Three, two, one, go. Right. What happened? Jane, how was that one minute for you? Aside from wanting to fall asleep because I'm getting over COVID and I'm still tired. Um, <laughs> no, it, it is hard because you, you, you hear other noises, you, you, you know, I started with my eyes just in a soft focus and it's like, oh, who else is closing their eyes? Is it okay? People are closing their eyes. I'll close my eyes. So you, yeah, you get distracted and it's, it's hard. Even if you've mm -hmm. practiced, which I have practiced it, it's, it's still hard. Yeah. Anybody else? I guess oh. I ran out of things. Like I was focusing on it, but then I ran out of things. So I just thought about the same things again. Like I already thought about, is it hard? Is it soft? Is it comfortable? Is it firm? Is it like, you know, I was trying to run through different things and then I thought of everything about the chair and then there wasn't anything else. So I just ran through it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's what the little exercise was meant to show. The chances are, and I think Jane elaborated on this for us, the chances are that you noticed how hard it is to focus on only one thing for 10 seconds, let alone a minute. Because little voices start in your head and thoughts come and go and you can't stop them. You really can't. Um, what you can do is recognize them and bring yourself back to the thing that you wanted to focus on. This is why people say, for example, focus on your breathing. But even if you focus on your breathing for one minute, you'll breathe in, you breathe out, breathe in. Breathe out, and before you get to the third breath, the thought will pop into your head, oh, I wonder what we're having for lunch today. 
I wonder if Pete will finish at one o'clock or whether he'll go over. I wonder what uh, so-and-so's doing with that task that I uh, assigned to them this morning. You can't help it. But there is a way that you can reduce the impact of the thoughts that are coming your way. So you probably, in some cases, lost track altogether of sitting in the chair and started thinking. I mean, that's just a given. What happened was your brain switched from the direct experience of sitting in a chair, which is internal focus, to the default network or the na narrative circuitry. That's what happens pretty much all the time. So again, we come back to being aware of experience as it occurs in real time and accepting what you see. It's OK to have a thought, providing you can pull yourself back to what you want to focus on. It's absolutely fine. And sometimes you'll have good thoughts and sometimes you'll have bad thoughts. Just let them all go. Don't matter. But focus on bring yourself back to what you want to focus on. So focus and attention. If you find it difficult, just take a pause for a second and think about all your colleagues that you judge and you make assumptions about all day, every day. Oh, so and so. He's not very good. You know, he takes ages to do this. Oh, he, he never makes a deadline. Blah, 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 blah. Well, if that's true. Take a step back and ask yourself, are we playing to that individual's strengths? What could we do? to help that individual to be mindful about the things that I'm judging, which is naughty, or assuming, which is naughty, that they're not doing right. And how do you know you're right anyway? Because your inner brain tells you, well, of course, that's the way it is. Why? Why? Because, well, because I thought that. But because you thought that, don't make it right. So mindfulness is a way of accepting different scenarios. And yours might not necessarily be the full picture. So narrative circuitry, planning, goal setting, strategizing, it's important. Direct experience, noticing more real time information, less imprisoned by the past, all your habits, all your expectations, all your assumptions. You are more able to respond to events as they unfold in a way that is more positive than negative. So the sensory information you perceive by the direct experience map or network includes information about yourself, these thoughts, these feelings, these emotions, these internal states. And why is that important when you're at work? Because it gives us the ability to notice more about what's going on in the brain while we're trying to work. And that's the whole rest of your mind at work program in a nutshell. Noticing when you're too tired to function. Noticing when you're getting overwhelmed with work and tasks and others are getting overwhelmed with work and tasks. Noticing when you need to switch off to gain more insight into an issue. And these observations are easier through mindfulness. So mindfulness is something that you can achieve through practice and um, I'm not going to get technical with the details today, but all of those maps, circuits and networks that we've talked about earlier, you know, these little grey cells or little white cells firing their electrical pulses, which create chemicals, which then tell you what to do. All of those things through mindfulness can be rewired through pr the practice of mindfulness. This is what science, neuroscience is telling us right now. This is these, you know, these are recent developments this century. It's not been kind of over the last 50 years, it's within the last 15 years or so that people have really started to understand that the brain is hardwired, but it can be rewired. And mindfulness is the way that you rewire the brain. So Farb's work showed that people can be taught how to recognize whether they are in the direct experience or the narrative map, or they are in the alternative, the direct experience and that which one they're using at any one time. And if you recognize it, how to switch between them, because both can bring positives. Brown's work from Virginia Commonwealth University found that people high on the mindfulness scale have more cognitive control, a greater ability to shape what they do and what they say than people lower on the mass scale. 
So when you see people now behaving in a way that you don't appreciate or necessarily like, maybe one of the questions to ask yourself before doing anything is, hmm, I wonder how they deal with interception. I wonder where they would be hypothetically on this Mars scale. Because that's really what it's all about. The greater cognitive control to shape what you do and what you say to control those things with the pause that we talked about right at the beginning. So the more you notice your own experience, the more opportunities you have to become mindful. Stop and observe. You can achieve this without meditating on a mountain. You can actually do it at work, but it's not easy when there's a lot going on or you're under pressure. I mean, I'd be the first person to, to acknowledge that. But the point is, if you're at your desk emailing and you just literally put your hands on the desk in front of you and pay attention to the, your next three breaths. You've just been mindful. If that was truly where your focus was and think about it as not just the fact that you were breathing in, but breathing out. But what did it feel like? Did you feel the air, if you breathed in through the nostrils? Did you feel the, the temperature of the air if you breathed out through the nostrils? All of those things help you to be mindful. So think of mindfulness as a habit, a skill that can be learned. And maybe it's not that difficult, but what is difficult is remembering to be mindful. We can all increase our score on the mass scale the way that we practice interception, but it's remembering to do it because we're all busy people and the modern world doesn't lend itself to remembering to be mindful because we have all these distractions, which is the point of the December session that I'll be running, uh, how we handle that and how we try and stay mindful through distractions when we're trying to do a million things at once. So the more you practice, the more you're able to come to respond in the most helpful way to each challenge that's gonna come your way on a daily basis. And each of your colleagues is gonna be facing the same challenges or different challenges, but they're coming at you thick or fast. This is why Unilever Australia now run mindfulness exercises for their staff every morning between 8.30 and nine o'clock. And it's optional, you don't have to attend, you don't have to participate, but many of those employees actually do. And what is the company getting out of that? more productivity, more people who are focused, more people who are happier, more business relationships that are improving, more dignity in the workplace, respect in the workplace, everything working better because people are aware of being aware, meta-awareness, and thinking about their thinking, metacognition. And they, they see, they, Unilever Australia, see the key to this as being practicing mindfulness every day before the working day starts while everybody's fresh or hopefully while everybody's fresh. Now I do have uh, up my sleeve a whole series of exercises uh, that I got from this website mindfulnessexercises.com uh, that you can practice or you can refer other people to if you if you want to uh, that cover all of the topics on the board and many others. Um, so, you know, if you might say, for example, you know, avoiding burnout, that would be interesting. What's the mindfulness exercise for avoiding burnout? And I would be able to share that with you either in a peer group or, um, you know, just uh, sharing the actual worksheets that this uh, uh, mindfulnessexercises.com have provided. They, they're not actually free, I do hasten to add, but I do have a set of, I think, uh, 60 or 70 that cover how to improve workplace effectiveness through mindfulness. So you'll see some topics there that you will recognize, managing stress, the power of focus, embracing the growth mindset. So when there's change that needs to be made in the workplace, mindful time management. I know that's a topic James is gonna cover in the future. Uh, embracing change, managing overwhelm, and my favorite, the myth of multitasking, which is, again, part of the December uh, program 
that we're going to be uh, going through with you. So now in the uh, last few minutes that I've got available or we've got available, unless people want to stay a little bit longer, uh, let's have a discussion around the unexamined life, observing yourself is not worth living. So not observing yourself is not worth living. You have to look in before you can look out. If you are to avoid making assumptions and judgments of others and assumptions and judgments about yourself. So the awareness that rises by paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, how that can improve you, improve uh, your workplace effectiveness and those around you. Calm, clear thinking, replacing habitual reactive patterns. So does anybody have any thoughts or comments about anything that I've run through today as part of mindfulness, which will run through as a theme through all the other Your Mind at Work presentations in through November through to June. Um, I could say a question about uh, mind, um, the difference between mindfulness and uh, being mindless. In When you're not paying attention, so you're being mindless, which are the network that are more active? If you're actually being mindless and not paying attention, yeah. uh, you're more on the narrative nar uh, network than the uh, direct experience network. But is the brain aware of the signal that are coming from outside and are those signals being evaluated or used at all? Your brain is aware because it's the brain that's sending the signals. But whether you are consciously aware is how you how you get there is through mindfulness, because mindfulness will teach you, oh, I'm in narrative mode. Oh, I'm in direct experience mode, understanding that you can have one or the other, but not both. And then being able to swap between the two. So mindfulness is really being a, just being aware of which network you're using at the moment in the present moment exactly right I, absolutely right right now right now most of us right now are in uh, the default mode because of the nature of the peer group the presentation the fact that information is being presented to you from the external world which you are processing but when we went into the exercise over the chair and i shut up heaven be praised, for one minute, you hopefully, at least for one or two seconds, went into direct experience mode. And it's recognizing when you're in each of those is generated through mindfulness, the awareness of being aware. 